Now that we know a bit more about inequality constraint optimization, let's apply the principle of dual optimization to the problem of training maximum margin classifiers. We will show that via this dual optimization approach, uh, we naturally come to a kernel formulation of the maximum margin classifier, for which we can show that the classifier itself will base its predictions only on a few data points. Such data points will be called support vectors, and the classifier itself will be called a support vector machine. Previously, we considered the optimization of linear classifiers by the principle of maximizing the margin. So a linear classifier bases its predictions or its decisions on a uh, linear decision boundary. So if points fall on one side of this boundary, they will be assigned to one class. And if they fall on the other side, they will be assigned to the other class. Now uh, we reason that we actually want to margin this, this boundary because that will give us the, the most stable uh, linear classifier in the end. Okay, so what we did, we derived an expression for uh, the distance of each point to the margin. And that was actually given by this expression over here. So uh, the distance of a point to my decision boundary is given by R. And then we said, let the closest point to my decision boundary uh, define the margin. Let that be the margin. Then it turned out that we could uh, select several W that, that would give me the same margin size. So in order to keep things simple, we decided to calibrate this W such that uh, this term in the numerator evaluates to one. And then we get this very simple expression for uh, the margin, namely one over uh, the norm of W. Okay, so by resorting to this definition of the margin, we actually have that for all data points, we have that this particular term evaluates to one or uh, bigger, to, uh, bigger than one. And yeah, now our objective is to ma maximize this margin. So we maximize this quantity and that is equivalent to minimizing this particular quantity. So a half times uh, the norm of W squared. So this is much more convenient to work with. So we formulated the following constraint minimization problem. We want to minimize uh, or actually maximize the margin, minimize this thing under the constraint that this entity uh, evaluates to one or bigger than one. Okay, so that's where we ended and that's where we continue now. So now we know a bit more about constraint optimization and we know how to solve such problems. And this relied on a definition of a Lagrangian and a dual Lagrangian. And now the objective of this video is to derive this dual Lagrangian and this dual optimization problem and then show that we can obtain solutions to this problem uh, based on a, a kernel uh, viewpoint. Okay, so let's do this. Let's uh, maximize the margin. So this means we're going to solve this uh, minimization problem. So this uh, inequality constraint uh, minimization problem. And the first step in doing so is to define uh, my uh, primal Lagrangian function, right? So that, that's given over here. So this is essentially um, f of w. So my uh, main objective that I want to minimize. And now minus all my uh, constraints. So this uh, thing over here is my constraint and I have n of such. For each data point, I have this particular constraint. Now, um, a, a note here. So in the previous video, I talked about a constraint maximization problem. Now I talk about a constraint minimization problem. So that's why we see this minus sign and not uh, the plus as we have saw, uh, seen in the previous video. And then each of these ans uh, denote uh, the Lagrange multiplier. for each of the n constraints uh, that I have. Okay, and then in this optimization framework, I have that my uh, primal parameters, so those are my w's and b's, so my model parameters, my primal uh, variables, uh, they have to satisfy the KKT conditions as well as my dual uh, variables. And this basically means I have primal feasibility, so that means that, well, my primal variable w needs to satisfy this constraint that we put over here. But then we also have that our dual variables need to satisfy this uh, constraint, that they have to be uh, larger um, or equal uh, to zero. And then we saw in the previous video that we also have to deal with complementary slackness. So that's that at least one of the two has to be equal uh, to zero. That's uh, captured in this uh, particular expression. Now, and then our objective is uh, to derive the dual Lagrangian. So the dual Lagrangian was defined as uh, the minimization. So again, that was a minimization because I work with this constraint minimization problem. So the dual Lagrangian is the minimizer uh, of my uh, primal Lagrangian over X and B for a fixed uh, set of um, Lagrange multipliers A. 
And then the strategy is to uh, first de derive the stationary points of my uh, primal Lagrangian and then use them to uh, eliminate uh, my primal variables from my original Lagrangian. And that gives me a dual Lagrangian which only depends on my dual variables A. And then the idea was, because I've now worked with a convex optimization problem, a constrained convex optimization problem, uh, this means that I have strong duality, which means that the maximizer of my uh, dual Lagrangian uh, then defines my uh, globally optimal solution in my uh, primal case. So our objective is to really derive this dual Lagrangian because that gives us access in the end to our uh, final solution which we are after. Okay, so let's derive the dual Lagrangian then. So this was our uh, definition of the primal Lagrangian. And now we're going to compute the derivatives with respect to our primal parameters and set it to zero and then solve for our primal uh, variables. So if we take the derivative with respect to W, so we have a half, uh, yeah, let's call it W squared. So that gives me W transpose. And then we have a W over here. So that gives me minus the sum over A and T and X and uh, transpose. And this is set equal to zero. And we can move this particular term to the other side and take the transpose on both sides. And that gives us uh, this expression for W. So that means uh, in terms of A, in terms of my dual variables, uh, my W is expressed as follows because then it satisfies this optimality criterion. Okay, then similarly for uh, the derivative with respect to B, we can compute it. So we only see a B over here, so we have minus the sum a n times tn uh, times b, so this is the particular derivative. So this tells me that we have this additional constraint actually on my uh, dual variables a n. Okay, so we just derived these constraints on w and a n, and now let's use it to eliminate uh, my uh, my primal variables from uh, from the primal Lagrangian. And we'll do this by factorizing uh, this particular term over here. That makes it a bit easier for us. So we see this W um, over here and we see it over here. So let's make this a factorization. So we have a W transpose. Okay, so that covers uh, this part and yeah, this part. And now let's take a look at the other items. So then we have Okay, so I'm just writing out this particular term, right? Uh, I'm writing it in a slightly more convenient form. And then we recognize that we have this expression for W. Uh, so that's what we recognize over here. So this means we can rewrite this as minus a half W transpose W, right? Because uh, well, a half W minus W gives me minus a half W. Okay, so this term reduces to this. Then in this term, this b doesn't depend on n, so we can move it up front. So that gives us 1 minus b sum over n is 1 to n, a n, t n, and then we have the other term. Okay, and then now here we can use this identity, namely that the sum over uh, all n, a n, t n evaluates to 0. So this thing it's going to be zero. That simplifies things a lot. And then we just fill in this expression for W that we have over here. So let, let's just fill in. And that gives me the following expression for the dual Lagrangian. So we have this dual Lagrangian given as follows. And we still need to deal with these particular constraints. So this was, uh, well, the, the dual feasibility constraint that we already have from the KKT conditions. But now we also still have this additional constraint given uh, over here. And know that this particular constraint will now always be satisfied, right? Because we use this expression in our um, derivation here. So we use this to eliminate W using this particular form. Okay, so now we have derived our dual Lagrangian. And now we can formulate our dual optimization problem, so, which means that we want to maximize this dual Lagrangian with respect to A, with respect to our Lagrange multipliers, uh, still under the constraint that each of these Lagrange multipliers has to be uh, equal to zero or bigger than zero. And we have this additional constraint over here. Now, this is a constraint optimization problem that we can solve. I'm not going to solve it explicitly in these videos, but there are numerical solvers to do this uh, for you. But the main point to realize here is that we deal with a convex optimization problem in the primal case. So that means that uh, the, the solution to this dual optimization problem, so the maximizer A that maximizes dual Lagrangian, then essentially in the end gives us the solution to my uh, primal problem. And we can actually get back to my primal uh, 
solution via the following derived entity, right? So we saw that optimality conditions for the, uh, the primal Lagrangian gave me this. So if I find the optimal ANs via this problem, I can directly map into my uh, weights W via this uh, particular expression. Okay, so now we are able to solve our original uh, maximum margin uh, problem um, via this dual uh, optimization problem. And now we can make things more interesting uh, because now this whole optimization framework, the maximum margin a classifying framework was based on these original data points. So on my feature space, in my original feature space, let's say. But now we can make things more interesting by working with a kernel. So we can apply the kernel trick and replace every instance of xn, xn, xm with the kernel of xn, xm. So that gives me this uh, dual Lagrangian. So this would really mean that um, I would implicitly work with a feature space defined by this kernel and this kernel could uh, represent maybe some infinite dimensional feature space. So this is very powerful. So now we can actually obtain maximum margin classifiers in a very high dimensional feature space by applying uh, this kernel tricks and that leads to eventually to very uh, non-linear decision boundaries, right? Because in this space I could only work with linear decision boundaries, but if I apply some basis function transformations on my data points, I can uh, map this to a nonlinear decision boundary. Okay, but we applied this kernel trick to uh, the dual Lagrangian. So that tells me that my solutions can be obtained via such uh, kernels, via such abstract uh, feature representations. But of course, my decisions also have to be made then using the corresponding kernel. So let's see if we can also rewrite this. And that means that we have to rewrite our predictive model into this kernel form, right? So this was my primal formulation of my uh, predictive model, based, parameterized with these Ws. But then we saw that we uh, derived from the optimality constraint of my Lagrangian, this mapping from uh, dual variables to my uh, primal variables. So if we would simply substitute this, it gives us this dual uh, formulation of my predictive model we again apply this kernel trick. So we see that also now my predictive uh, models can be defined in terms of this kernel and uh, the dual variables a n. So really this thing is uh, the dual formulation using the kernel trick of my original uh, linear classifier. Okay, so we derived a way for um, building maximum margin classifiers, namely by optimizing this dual Lagrangian that gives me this uh, solution for A, so with respect to my, it, it gives me a solution for the dual variable, and then uh, my classifier can be expressed in terms of this dual variable via this uh, kernel representation over here. Now the interesting thing is because we put this into this uh, dual formulation framework and we have this KKT constraints, we can actually say things about these uh, dual variables. Uh, first of all, we can say that uh, well, du dual feasibility is satisfied for our solutions, meaning that all my uh, dual variables are either positive or they are zero. So let, let's consider these two cases. Let's consider the case where an is positive. Well, we have complementary slackness, so that means that uh, the product of these terms has to be zero always. Uh, so if an is positive, that means that this particular term is zero. And that in turn implies uh, that tn times yn equals 1. Uh, so this was really my definition of uh, the support vectors or uh, the vectors that really have the closest distance to my margin, uh, to my uh, decision boundary. So these are the points for which an is bigger than 0. Okay, so those are my uh, support vectors. Those are the points that directly lie on my margin. So those are the, the, the vectors that actually define my predictions. Uh, but then this complementary slackness also implies that whenever a n is zero, or maybe conversely, whenever this term uh, is larger, uh, is large, so this will work essentially all the points beyond uh, the margins, this expression evaluates to bigger than zero. That means that my dual variables have to be zero for all, all, all these points that do not lie on the margin. So all these points, they get assigned a zero a n. So a n is zero for these points. And therefore they do, they do not contribute to my uh, final prediction. And that explains why we can uh, call such models support vector machines, because they only base their predictions on, on a very few points that support my uh, final prediction. Okay, then a final note. So we uh, I talked a lot about these uh, dual variables, which we can uh, derive via my uh, dual optimization uh, framework. 
Uh, but of course, my predictions also depend on, on these bees, right? On these bees. And now we can find these bees actually using the fact that for my support factors, this expression holds, right? We saw that whenever a n is bigger than zero, then we have that this uh, expression holds. That's actually that this thing is equal to zero. Um, so that's how we can find b. So we can just pick one of these x n's for which I have a non-zero a n and, and then solve it. So, so let's do that. Let, so this is my predictive model where I now fill in this x n and then my predictions are based on all the support factors, uh, all the, the factors which have non-zero um, zero variable, variable a. So that's indicated over here. All indices that are, uh, have non-zero uh, dual variables, those define my uh, predictions. Okay, then I'm just rewriting this. So I multiply everything on the left and right. So I multiply it with Tn on both sides. And then use the fact that the square of T, Tn, which was only minus one or one. So this thing always evaluates to one. So that brings me to, to this particular line. And then I can move this uh, to the other side. And that gives me the expression for B and, and I'm done basically. Okay, so once I have derived my uh, dual variables, uh, my bias term can be directly obtained by just picking one of these uh, support factors and evaluate this expression with only that uh, one data point. But it turns out that it's actually much more stable to average over all support factors because maybe my numerical solver will make some errors in, these, uh, in obtaining these uh, dual variables. And then it's, it's actually more stable to just take the average over all my obtained Bs for each uh, non-zero support factor. Okay, but that's all there is to it. And then we can actually build this uh, maximum margin classifier, right? So, and we can choose a kernel however we want. Uh, so this it now then defi defines my maximum margin classifier. And in this particular example, um, we are going to build this support factor machine using Gaussian kernels. So with kernels of this particular form, and implicitly, these uh, kernels, they represent infinite dimensional uh, feature spaces. And now the interesting thing of this particular experiment is we have all these observed uh, data points and we want to classify them into groups. They're labeled, so the blue class and the red class. This data set is not linearly separable, right? So in my original space, I could not, could not draw a decision boundary that separates the two classes. But now when I use this kernel trick, I actually implicitly map uh, these data points to this high dimensional feature space in which there exists actually a linear uh, a decision boundary that perfectly separates the classes. So that's the main strength of support factor machines that we can uh, use this kernel trick to come up with very, uh, with basically very complex uh, decision boundaries. So let me draw that actually. So here in black, you, uh, well, I'm now drawing it in green, is the obtained decision boundary and uh, what you see over here. So the encircled points are uh, the support factors. And what I'm drawing here in red is going to be the margin for the red class. And when I, what I'm drawing now here in blue is going to be the margin for uh, the blue class. Okay, now a final note. Suppose my data set contains some outliers, then, okay, these points would, would still be valid. But let's say I would have a data point somewhere over here. Then actually, uh, this support factor machine is guaranteed to separate the data sets. So then you would actually have a very complicated decision boundary. Maybe it looks something like this, uh, or maybe it actually adds this region uh, to the blue classification uh, region. And these very complex shapes can be achieved by uh, tweaking your kernel a bit. Basically a large uh, sigma means I have uh, very smooth decision boundaries. And when it becomes smaller, I'm allowed to make these very shaky uh, decision boundaries. Uh, so I do have some control over how smooth I want my decision boundaries uh, uh, to be. But a better approach, and that is what we're going to discuss in the net next video, is to relax this constraint of hard separability of these two classes, uh, actually. And we're going to do that uh, by defining what we call a soft margin classifier.